till the computer gets warmed up. Good evening, the past and the present Cartonians, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great privilege to be here, and I dare say it's a singular honor for me to be addressing such an august audience. When my friend Suchindranath walked up the stage and talked about me, I was sent back in time. And I remembered my days, whenever we had to settle scores, we called the people behind the chapel. <laughs> but I believe there is no space left there now. <laughs> we were just 750 students in school, and today I learned that there are 6,000 people. It's good to grow in numbers, but I'm sure we will not dilute despite the growing numbers. Such illustrious names, such illustrious Cotonians, and now I see in front of me a wide sea of the green and gold from amongst whom I'm sure we are going to get the future leaders and the future generals of a nation. I think it was the Duke of Wellington who said that the future wars of Europe are going to be fought in the lawns of Eton or Harvard. And I dare say, if it was a Cotonian in 1957 who was the chief, and in 47 the one who introduced the Stuart tanks to the Georgila Heights, surprised the enemy, turned the tide and pushed them back. And if it was in 99 that a humble soldier again did his best with his troops and contributed towards the army's efforts, I don't see any reason why we cannot have future leaders from our present students. Well, gentlemen, it's been eight years now since Kargil has happened. And Despite these eight years that have gone by, we have such a huge audience in front of me, I would say this augurs well, not only for the school and the future generation, but for the whole nation. Because a nation and its people who forget their soldiers soon cease to exist, like all the great empires. What we did in Kargil was but our humble way of doing our duty. And before I start and launch on to what happened there, a small story, a small part of the huge battle that we fought there, I have a message for the new generation of Cotonians. I have just three things to tell you. Dare to dream. That's number one. Have the confidence. Never doubt your capabilities. And thirdly, go for it. Do it. Don't vacillate. With these, these three messages, I now come down to the main topic for the evening for which you have been waiting for. I ordered people in war, but uh, the computer is a very different matter altogether. <laughs> right, gentlemen. We fought four wars with Pakistan. 1947, 
65, 71, and the last one was 1999. And every time we fought with him, we sent him back with a bleeding nose. However, towards the end, I will tell you how fascinating the propaganda is. They still felt they have won the wars. It was only after Operation Vijay, where the media played a very major role, did they come to know that they had actually got a spanking and they were sent back. Before I come down to the actual battle, I feel that we should know a little bit about our history and a little bit of geography of that particular area so that you understand as to what exactly I'm talking about. The figure that you see here with the black outline is the line drawn by Sir Ratcliffe. This line which you see over here is the line of control. And the area which is bounded between this and the black line is what is now known as the Pakistan occupied Kashmir. Forms 35% of the entire area. NJ9842 is what is known as the Siachen Glacier. This AGPL is the actual ground position line. You'll be proud to know that in the Indian Army in 1984, or rather 83, launched an operation, Operation Megdud, and occupied this Siachen Glacier because Pakistan was trying their best to sponsor a lot of expeditions to that place and claim the rights to Siachen Glacier. The Indian Army got wise to this, occupied this, and when they attacked it in 1984, we were more than prepared for them and we sent them back. Therefore, as per the old agreement, the line was supposed to go thence northwards from 9842. But today I am happy to tell you, it goes slightly westwards and then northwards. This area with the red line over here and the LAC written here is the line of actual control. And the area between this red line and this black line is the area which has been occupied by China and is known as Akshay Chin and it constitutes 8% of the total area. A word about Akshay Chin and its importance. When China occupied Tibet, the only route for him to administer Tibet was through this area of Akshay Chin. Because if he had to go all around this place, then the Tibetan plateau and the high Himalayan mountains over here would have meant an almost impossible task for them to make a road to administer Tibet from the Xinjiang sector district. So therefore, they have made a beautiful highway over here, right joining the Xinjiang district onto Tibet. And since we have a China expert here, we'll talk about that later. It is up to us now to think whether China is going to leave this place, Aksai Chin. It's so important to him. Some of you would feel why this LC here, LAC here, why can't they make up the mind and why have two, two terminologies? This is basically against China and this is against Pakistan. When we talk about Jammu and Kashmir, the general idea is that all the people there are Muslims. But demographically, there are three distinct groups residing in this area, which you must know. Firstly, in the general area, between this great Himalayan range over here, is the Ladakh region. Predominantly peace-loving Buddhists. Fifth, then the area between the Himalayan range and the huge Peer Panjal range, the mighty Peer Panjal range, is a very rich and a fertile valley, which is known as the Srinagar Valley, the valley region of Jammu and Kashmir, predominantly occupied by Muslims. And the area south of the Peer Panjal over here are the plains of Jammu, predominantly Hindus, the Dogras who occupied this. Therefore, you have an idea about the distinct demographies of this place. Interestingly, this complete area of Jammu and Kashmir was administered by the, 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 the Pakistan and erstwhile India from the west, from the general area of Rawalpindi and Gujranwala side. Therefore, in 1947, when the raiders came in attacking India and 
General Timaya had brought in the tanks at Jojila over here. There were no roads existing which con connected Jammu plains onto the mountains and the valley of Srinagar and Kashmir. It was only in 1950 that a road was made which joined the areas of Pathankot, Jammu onto the valley and beyond to Kargil and to Leh Ladakh. So this in short is the geography of Jammu and Kashmir. Secondly, the road. Now this road which joins Jammu, Udhampur, Srinagar, Jojila Pass, Kargil and onto Leh is truly the lifeline of this area. This is the lifeline because you will come to know the complete crux of the problem which is existing between India and Pakistan and the operations thereon are basically based on the road joining Jammu, Udhampur, Srinagar, Jojila Pass, Leh. Here, Jojila Pass, the place where Jan Thimaya had sent the steward tanks, I will show you that pass and you will be amazed and then you will probably appreciate the Herculean task that he had undertaken even as early as 1947. This road remains closed about three to four months a year because of heavy snow. The bottleneck is Zojila Pass at an altitude of approximately 8,000 feet above sea level and uh, because of heavy snow it's closed. Some of you might wonder why don't they have those snowmobile, the snow, mobile, the, snow um, uh, uh, the, the um, uh, dozers to clear it off. But when you see Jojila Pass in the next slide, you will probably understand better. This, ladies and gentlemen, is Jojila Pass. You can see the trucks, they are all facing upwards. It's not because the discipline of the people over there are good. It's just that the road is so narrow that we have certain up convoy days and certain down convoy days. And this is probably the up convoy day where trucks laden with fuels and supplies are packed and sent up to supply the complete area of Jammu and Kashmir. Then we have an alternate road, which is the road Pathan Kot, Kulu, Manali, Ratong Pass, Karu and on to Leh. This is the alternate road. But the mountains of this general area are very young. They are not yet stabilized. Therefore, there are a lot of landslides all around beyond Manali and Ratong Pass and on to Karu. Therefore, this road at best at the moment can be used as a supplementary uh, road in addition to this road which is the lifeline, but it cannot be a main access to be used. Now besides this, we also have the air. The flight takes off from Delhi onto Jammu, Srinagar and onto Leh. The Leh airport itself is located at an altitude of 11,000 feet above sea level. Therefore, even the tourists who go there because of hypoxia, that's the lack of oxygen in the air, they feel sick and uh, they, they, they are overcome with nausea. And this airstrip, not even an airport, an airstrip being at an altitude of 11,000 feet, the aircraft can function only at a capacity of about 60% of its total capacity. So at best, it can only fly in those critical supplies or critical medical supplies and fly out or critical, critically ill people. It cannot be used tactically or strategically to bring in your much needed supplies to that area. So these are some of those aspects which require little attention. Jammu, Srinagar and on to Leh. Now let's come down to the question of why did Kargil happen? There are a lot of versions to it, there are a lot of reasons to it. But the most interesting one, it was in 1965 when Operation Gibraltar was planned by the Pakistan Army. Under Operation Gibraltar, they trained 30,000 people in Pakistan. The plan was very simple. It was to coincide on for 8th of August when it was the Peer Dastagir's birthday, when they had those huge jathas 
processions passing there. These 30,000 trained people with their armed caches already inside India would infiltrate into India in small groups of 30s, 40s, 50s. And once inside India, they would again regroup into cohesive and very, very formidable groups of hundreds, take out their arms and ammunition, use the day of 8th of August, Pir Dastagir's birthday for the processions, etc., and then attack installations, ammunition dumps, carry out assassinations, and create mayhem behind our lines. And when the, and when the army would be sufficiently busy looking after these people or trying to take counter-action, that is the time they would coordinate with a beautiful surgical move with a whole armor dev and severe the head of Jammu and Kashmir. But they miscalculated. They thought the Muslims, uh, Muslim brothers in Kargil would help them. But just the opposite happened. Instead of helping them, they actually came and informed the Indian Army. And before they could actually create chaos, we were already absolutely alert. And most of the groups, they were destroyed, total attrition was caused, and some of them survived and went back into Pakistan. And one such group led by about 30, 40, uh, led by a second lieutenant, 30, 40 of them, also just managed to save his life and he went back into Pakistan swearing vengeance. Now this same lieutenant grew in ranks and somewhere in 1987, he was given the task of capturing Siachen Glacier, that NJ 9842, because it was a matter of prestige for them. He was to operate from a post called the Kaide Azam post. He had become a colonel and he was commanding the SSG troops. There's the special action group, special services group, equivalent to our commandos. This colonel was a very brave man. He remembered the beating he had taken in 65 and with all might, he tried his best to attack our post. The Indian army was again alert and the regiment which defended stoutly over there was the regiment of General Thimaya, the Kumau regiment, one of the battalions of the Kumau regiment, and they pushed back the attack. They not only pushed back the attack, but they also counter-attacked and captured the Kaide Azam post. And again this colonel went back with most of his troops lost. And it was this colonel who later on grew in ranks who planned this operation, who became also the president, General Parvez Musharraf. Because in 71, the biggest humiliation that the Pakistan army got was the surrendering of 93,000 fully armed prisoners of war that we got in Bangladesh. That was a humiliating blow from them. And with all this fresh in mind, with all vengeance, and it is his plan. Though, though the plan was already made much earlier, but it was his doing where he pushed this plan forward and Kargil happened. I am often asked, Colonel, when you fought this war, you must have fought against heavy odds. It's a very relative uh, word, heavy odds. What does heavy odds mean? I will explain what the heavy odds we faced. I feel that we did not face one enemy. We faced three enemies when we went into Kargil. The first enemy was the high altitude. We operated in altitudes of 18,000 feet above sea level. And at 18,000 feet above sea level, the temperatures are around minus 29 to minus 32 degrees Celsius. And some of us old Catonians who were used to that old uh, aluminium trays in our freezers, whenever we wanted to have a drink, we used to pull out those aluminium freezers. I'm sure we remember how our finger used to get stuck when we pulled out those aluminium uh, trays, ice trays. And in altitudes like this, by chance, in an emergency, when you grabbed your rifle, 
your rifle, your hand got stuck to that rifle, and it took a lot of effort with a knife and warm water to get your hands out of that. And at minus 32 degrees Celsius, there are a lot of other medical problems that go with it. I told you about hypoxia, the lack of oxygen in the air. That itself, with the biological and the chemical, uh, biochemical reactions in your body, produces a lot of diseases like pulmonary edema, in which your body fluid, instead of you perspiring it out or throwing it out the natural way, it starts getting collected into your lungs. And then soon, before you realize it, you are actually drowning in your own fluid, you are frothing pink in your mouth, and you are dead within 15 to 20 minutes. In the initial stages, in the army, we used to try and evacuate them by calling the helicopters. Biggest mistake. Because the helicopters took them, and when it took off, what happened? It gained altitude. And instead of saving him, he actually died. But these days we have a decompressant bag by which the pressure is dropped immediately and it, it, it simulates a, uh, the, the uh, effect where you drop altitude by almost 2,000 feet and you save lives. Then we have the cerebral edema where the fluid gets collected now into your brains and then a person goes crazy. He does all sorts of stupid things and it could end into a fatality. We had cases like that. Then you have your other uh, uh, associated uh, medical problems like your uh, uh, trench foot, chill blains, where your uh, complete uh, skin and your digits, they get frozen and the cells go die. You get your frostbite, which my boys told me, those people who got frostbite, they said, Sir, this is the worst affliction. Says even the enemy should not get this, it's so painful. You get gangrene and you see your digits falling off. Young sentries who are not used to this high altitude and this extreme cold would be standing sentries outside and next morning they used to be found frozen dead. Because I'll tell you, I'll share this with you. When you're outside and it's very, very cold and when you're suffering from hypothermia, suddenly you get a feeling of a nice warm feeling through your abdomen over here. And an inexperienced soldier will at, at that time sit down. And that is his death knell. The experienced soldier will become alert immediately and he'll start getting active. Because he knows now the end is near. So these are some of the medical problems which are faced over there on top. Now the extreme cold also had some very funny moments. When we go and camp there at 18,000 feet, we are not on terra firma. We are not on soil which you see outside. We are actually staying on a solid glacier. And once due to the seismic uh, movements, when these uh, plates crack over there, the glaciers crack, it's like an atomic blast. I mean your whole heart starts shaking. And in that extreme cold, even doing your normal chores in the morning used to be a very, very difficult task. You know, we have the great Indian habit of, you know, in the, the, the older times, they used to, at around 5, 5.30, take their lotta and go on to the field. Similarly, the areas in high altitude is just like another jungle, white jungle over there. But we used to be pained, we used to think, how do I do it tomorrow? Because you got to expose some skin in that cold. Can you imagine the problem? So we used to plan our activities, have two patilas, one boiling water, the other one boiling tea. And you keep on having tea. And once the pressure inside your stomach and the pressure over here is matching, you quickly fill the bottle with boiling, boiling water and you run for it. <laughs> and sometimes of course, you feel a little more comfortable and you take a little more time. And that is the time disaster struck. Because when it came for the time to wash, it was solid. <laughs> I'm only sharing this with you. It's a laughing matter now, but for us it was terrible. 
And in the initial stages, in the initial stages when we all went to Siachen Glacier, when the army went to Siachen Glacier, we had a unique problem, very, very unique problem. We had the small tents and we slept there. And at night, because of very, 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 very solid winds which are prevailing in that area, it was very windy, what used to happen was something called a pillaring effect. You know, the complete, the place where the tent is, it used to be maintained over there and, the, and all the area and the ice around your tent, that used to melt. So next morning, you suddenly found yourself like that sleeping beauty on top of the tent on a pillar over there in a pedestal. And the, everything else has gone down, the level has gone down. And of course, because you have been running just 15 to 20 yards all around doing your job, you have those lovely yellow minarets all around you, well preserved. So these days, we have those, <laughs> we have the incinerators to destroy because it becomes, I mean, it doesn't be, uh, degrade over there. It's so fresh. So they, <laughs> I'm sure you wouldn't like to be in a situation like that. <laughs> well, besides this, Besides this, like I told you, when the plate shifts, there are cracks in the ice and then the crack over there is either known as a crevice in case the gap is small or a crevasse in case the gap is very large. If it's a crevasse, there's no problem, you can see it a mile off and you can avoid it. But if it's a crevice, then the crack is small and because it's a jagged sort of a crack and it's deep, almost a few kilometers deep, so when the soft snow falls on it, it covers the complete surface. And when the wind blows over that, the surface becomes hard. So with the result, the first one or two people who walk across, they go through safe. And the third fellow is suddenly swallowed inside. So we have those ropes to tie each other so that we can help each other. And people, while walking in a rope, the third person falls down. We try our best to save him. But after five, six minutes, if you can't pull him out, you cannot expose the others to danger. He may be your comrade, he may be your friend. We just tie a python over there, tie it up over there, leave it and cut the rope. Because what is the temperature inside that device? Minus 75 degrees Celsius. These are the realities of life there. Your physical capabilities are reduced by more than 60%, a fully grown man can barely carry about 5 to 6 kgs on his back. When you walk, you start wheezing and panting like an old man. When you breathe, your complete windpipe starts burning because of lack of oxygen. And you double over, pant, breathe hard, then take 2-3 steps again. And whenever we have rash young men who are trying to rush around and do things over there, they are the ones who become susceptible to pulmonary edema because they move around fast. Therefore, we have those huge captions and the boards put all around the battalion saying, don't try to be a gamma in the land of Lama. <laughs> <laughs> to save their lives. Then the second enemy we faced was the terrain. Steep, absolutely steep gradients, 80 degrees. As it is Survival and just walking a few steps is so difficult. Now to compound that problem, there are huge slopes like that. You've got to climb that. You've got to have your weapon because that's your uh, life. And you've got to have ammunition because you've got to use a weapon. And you've got to have ammunition for yourself and fuel for yourself, food. Others you cannot survive. You have to have warm clothing, others you'll freeze. So you can imagine the load that one has to carry and go up all these slopes. Extremely difficult. Then we had the third enemy, which was the enemy himself. Well entrenched, well equipped, well trained, well ensconced. Because the surprise was with him. He was the one who was the person who had planned it out. So they had planned it properly and they were well, well uh, entrenched in that place. So imagine with this cold, with that load, with this gradient, you're climbing up and he's firing at you. I would say he didn't even have used his bullets. He had to just throw stones. It would have come down whistling like missiles. That is the type of 
odds that I talk about. These are the odds that the brave men who fought in the cool climbs of Kargil faced. Now, this is a site of the Batalik sector. I basically wanted to show you this picture so that you understand the complete layout of the mountain over here and the type of operations that my battalion, the first 11 Gurkha rifles, fought. Now, this line that you see running across here, there are no mauve or purple lines running on the ground over there. Neither is there a friendly Pathan telling you, Bhai Saab, line yahan se jata hai. <laughs> it is just an imaginary line connecting the ridge lines or the highest points of the mountains over there. And therefore, the watershed of that area. And all of you know that watersheds are the origins of the mighty rivers that flow, like the Ganga, the Indus, the, the Brahmaputra. It starts with a small trickle and a few drops which have melted uh, from the glacier, comes into a stream, a mountain stream, a roaring stream, a river, and then a mighty river. And the area which is beyond this is the Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. The area which is around here is the area which we have got, the 57% of Jammu and Kashmir. And this are the spurs or the fingers which are coming out from the watershed. You must know that the Indian Army occupies all these heights. But come winter, when the snow becomes too much, 25 feet, 30 feet, 40 feet, and the temperatures go dip down as low as minus 30 and minus 40 degrees Celsius, and with the wind chill factor, it comes down further to minus 40 and minus 50 degrees Celsius, it becomes almost impossible to stay in a place like this. Siachen Glacier, which is just a 5 km front, takes as much as 5.5 to 6 crores a day for maintenance, for maintaining a small body of troops over there. This is 1300 kilometers. You can imagine the cost in terms of money, the cost in terms of lives, if you have to occupy these physically. Therefore, in the months of winter, when it becomes extremely difficult, the Indian Army comes down into warmer areas below. This line has been respected both by India and Pakistan. And we do not meddle with it during winter. But this time, they had a different design. Since the last three years, they have been reconnoitering the complete area here as and when we go down. They wanted to occupy all these areas for a reason which I shall show you and explain uh, to you with a diagram a little later. Now this is the same depiction of the same mountains which you saw just now. This is the bird's eye view and this is a sketch. Now this black line is the line of control which I showed you with that mauve colored line. And this was the arm which was coming down, which is the Khalubar ridge line. This was the Kukarthang ridge line and this was the Jubar ridge line. This red is the road, which is the National Highway 1 Alpha. And this is the mighty Indus River which flows next to it. Now what is the significance of these mountains? If I were to occupy Khalubar ridge line right up to here, and Kukarthang and Jubar right up to here, with my automatic weapons, my artillery and my observation posts, I can cut off these roads over here. And when I cut off the road, what happens? The supply dries off on top. And we severe the head of Jammu and Kashmir. Now, what was the Pakistani aim behind this operation, which they named as Operation Al-Badr in 1999? First was to realign the line of control. Just like I showed you, if they come and sit during the winters, right till the edge over here, here during winters, and before we can muster and the next summer we come over there, they keep firing at us. And then because of the nuclear threat and them possessing nuclear weapons and the nuclear warfare in this area, world opinion would come and they say, okay, maintain it like this. 
let the ceasefire line be there. And once they realign the LOC over here, what happens? We cannot use this road. Lifeline is severe. Master plan. So the first aim was to realign the line of control because it is their word against ours once they occupy it. Next aim was to isolate Siachen Glacier. They have tried their best to take Siachen Glacier so many times and every time we have sent them packing back. So this was a nice way without firing a shot. Just cut the supplies off, dry us off, no ammunition, no supplies. We have to vacate that place. Encourage insurgency in Ladakh. Very peace-loving people. But like they say, if there is no food in the belly, there is fire in the belly. When the supplies get cut, people go hungry, people go cold during winters because of lack of supply of FOL. Direct the ire towards the Indian government. And then these peace-loving people start insurgency amongst them. Boost the psychic morale of militants in JNK. I remember in 96, 97 when I was operating with a battalion over there, the morale of the militants had really come down because the grid that was created by the Indian Army in this complete area was so well coordinated that he would run from here, he would get trapped here, he would run from there, he would get trapped here because the Indian Army was there in full force. And to make matters worse for the militants, what happened in 97 or 98? Our Prime Minister, Atal Bihari Vajpayee, that Lahore bus yatra, he went to Lahore. And all along the TVs it was shown, Indian flag and Pakistan flag flying high over there, banquets over there arranged, biryanis being served, both of them embracing each other. The militants thought, we are being hunted like dogs over here, and the Prime Minister is being given biryani over there. <laughs> this was the actual feeling of these people. Therefore, by doing a Kargil, Parvez Musharraf wanted to send a silent message to them. Okay, look, this is the real one. That was just for show. Focus international attention on Kashmir issue. You must have seen in the TVs, somewhere in the 97-98s, you always saw one guy with a Kashmiri cap, animatedly, you know, raising his hands, shouting it out over there in the UN assembly and other people. And you saw the rest of the people almost sleeping and dozing it off, someone doodling on the pad, others talking like this. No one paid attention to the Kashmir issue. It was a dead issue. And by doing the Kargil now, they raised the issue again. They revived the issue. To that extent, they were little successful. Now the Pakistani plan, if this was their aim, then what was their plan? How did they mean to achieve this? This was the intrusion plan. This was the Kalubar area. They wanted to infiltrate in big groups in three areas. In the winters of 99, when the Indian army would withdraw down to the warm places, Pakistani forces would come and occupy in three major places. Kalubar, that is Batalik sector, Tololing and Tiger Hill, sector and one in the Moscow Valley which is further to the west. By doing that, they would cut off the roads, the national highway and deny supplies going up. Now this is the victory run of the first. The first is the first 11 Gurkha rifles, the battalion. This is the same Khalubar but depicted with an artist with all the peaks visible over here. I was sharing this that uh, whenever we show pictures of mountains, uh, most of my friends who are uh, not in the army, they say all these mountains look the same. I said I quite agree because I remember when I was a young uh, boy, I had a Sardarji friend and every time I went initially when I used to go to his house, any Sardarji used to come, I used to stand up and say good morning uncle. He used to slap me and say that's not my uncle, that's my servant. <laughs> so, I, know, I somehow could never figure out all Sardarjis look the same to me. I don't know, till this day I mean I, I find it difficult because the number of amount of the, you know thing exposed is very less. So, so, so after that to solve this problem, 
After that, to solve the problem, what I did was I stopped wishing. And lo and behold, after 15 days, a complaint came from his father. Bada battami is dost hai. Wish nahi karta hai. And then I said, yeah, please, I'm so sorry. You know, all Sadarjis look the same. He got very angry. He just kept quiet and moved away. After two days, he called me again. Come here. You, you said Sadarjis all look the same? I said, yes. You Chinkis also look the same. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to share this with you because all mountains look the same to you. But for us, it's a matter of life and death. Every fold, every fold we have to understand, we have to use it tactically, otherwise it could mean the death for us. So therefore, this is the same mountain which I showed you of Khalubar Ridge Line. You could see that finger-like projection which came out from there. This is the Khalubar Ridge Line, this is the Kukarthang Ridge Line, and this is the Gragio Nala which flows in between them. Now in 1999, we left this place and we came down to Yaldor sector which is down below over here. And by that time, the Pakistanis came and occupied this complete area. Normally, the winters start somewhere end October and last up to almost June, maybe mid to end June. But this time, Providence, God was with us, the snow started melting, thawing somewhere in the first week of May itself. Which meant that the Pakis did not get adequate time to make the defenses. So as soon as the thaw started happening, our patrols went to search all these areas. Small, small patrols go in advance and search the areas and then give a report back, all fine. And then the rest of the body of the troops move in. So when the patrols went in over here, various places like Son of Karliya's on 5th of May, that disappeared. Then another patrol which was sent over here on 8th of May, he made his patrol base here to leave all his heavy baggage and then moved with about 15 boys ahead to search this area. Because every area is searched. Every day a certain amount of area is searched and then he comes back, the rest is over there. Again next day he goes, he searches this area. They shift the patrol base further, then he searches that area, searches this area. It's a, it's a, it's a routine, it's a procedure. When this search was going on, for the first one day or so, the Pakis had all occupied this complete area over here and here. They were watching him. But they did not fire a shot. Because they needed that time to make the defenses. Second day, when he proceeded further here, and he took 15 boys ahead with him to patrol the areas further here, he suddenly realized that the Radio operator had forgotten to get his batteries, extra batteries. Each battery weighs almost one and a half to two kgs. So normally to avoid that weight, people leave the batteries behind and they go with one. But in high altitude, the batteries don't work for long. And to be out of communication is a crime. So this young captain stopped here for a while and sent this boy back. Just barely one kilometer. One would laugh at it. But in a mountain like this, suddenly there was a snow blizzard. And when a blizzard storm blows, you can't see anything. Your compasses go haywire. You can't see your hand in front of you because it's a total whiteout. And these boys, they stumbled on towards the right over here. When they stumbled on, bang onto the enemy position, the enemy had no choice but to fire at them and kill them. When the shots rang out and the storm went down, these people rushed to this place. Again, more people killed. Captain, that captain himself was injured and he was pinned down over here. Remainder of the people over here, they also rushed to help. Again, few killed, the rest pinned down. And that is the time when my battalion, the first 11 Gurkha rifles, was called to rescue and extricate these people. Till now, the impression in the army headquarters and in Delhi was that there are a couple of infiltrators, a couple of militants who are holed up in this area, remove them. Hold them by the scruff of the neck and remove them. My battalion, which was already on its way down from Siachen Glacier on to Pune on a peace tenure, was redirected. They said, you go via Kargil. And a company was sent here to extricate these people. 
When the company went to extricate the people, we managed to get them back. We sent the bodies back. We got this cap young captain also back. But the intensity of fire that came on us really made us look up. Said this cannot be the fire or the firepower of a militant. It has to be a trained soldier firing at us like this. Because we know how the fire comes at us. We know whether it's a trained man firing at you or it is someone, some militant, uh, stray militant firing at you. And the report was sent back. We were asked to probe all these areas around this place and say consolidate that area. We tried that. For two months we tried to consolidate that complete area here but we got no chance going further than this year. No chance going further than this year. The whole thing was so well occupied and very strong positions were already made there. And in those two months, which were nightmarish, we were pounded by artillery fire day in and day out. And only after continued reports did it finally dawn in Delhi that yes, truly the Pakistan soldiers are there and uh, we declared war. And then we were given the orders to go whole hog. I remember distinctly one day when I was sitting down here in Yadur sector, the shelling came. One shell landed just about 15 to 20 yards away from me. There were about three or four of my boys sitting down together and this shell came bang right in between them and all of them were blown to smithereens. It took me two days to collect the chunks of flesh together. We didn't know who had gone. After having faced this, we finally came to a conclusion that we've got to do something. And then we had one of our battle meetings in the divisional headquarters where everybody agreed that in this complete area of Batalik, if there is one place which is very, very important, the capture of which would uh, render it very advantageous for us, they said it would be this area of Khalubar top here. Now some of us might ask why Khalubar top? In mountains, you cannot move around left, right, anywhere like this. Here, there is a traffic jam, you take another route. If there is a traffic jam there, you can even leave the car and walk. But there you can't do it. There are limited tracks. You have to stick to those tracks. And if you go off the tracks and you walk against the grain of the, uh, the mountains over there, it's inviting death. You cannot survive for more than one or two days. So therefore, you are restricted to the tracks. Therefore, Kalubar was the place which was the communication hub as far as this was concerned. And if we captured Kalubar top, we not only stopped the supply route over here, we also cut off the retreat route from here and we turned the defenses of the enemy. Because if I am standing behind here, you throw missiles at me or stones at me, I can hide behind this. But you send a few people over here on my side, I become vulnerable on the side. I have to leave this place. So that is the analogy, that was the, uh, the plan which was there. But everybody knew that this is what is important and this is what has to be done. But again, the proverbial question of who will build the cat. And that is the time, as the commanding officer, I volunteered and I said, Sir, the Gurkha rifles, we will capture this Khaluba top. And I came back to the battalion headquarters and I shared this with all my boys. The moment they heard me the first time, they said, I have volunteered to capture this place because we are not even making an advance of an inch or a foot over here or here. We came under so much fire. And here we are talking about going behind lines over there and capturing Khaluba top, either from here or from here. Pathans are not exactly going to welcome you. Aye, Janam. So when my boys heard this, the jaws fell down. They thought, one of them confessed later on, they thought that I had got cerebral edema. <laughs> one of my officers, later during one of our social functions, he said, Sir, I want to share a thing with you, thought with you. I said, yes, tell me. He says, Sir, when you talked about capturing this uh, Khalubar top, you know, suddenly, my complete head, I went into an absolute delirium or a, uh, into a, uh, some other state. 
where I started seeing visions. And what did you see? He said it was just like one of those Hindi movies. It was a big white bungalow. Everything was white. People were wearing white. They were whispering silently and coming out of that house. So I also walked into the room. It was a white room. People were quiet and they were saying good chap and they were just whispering slightly. And there on the wall was a big portrait. There was a sandalwood ka mala there. A lot of agarbati is burning. And sir, your photo was there. <laughs> I'm telling you this just to tell you what is the type of reaction one gets when you are faced with an impossible task. And this is a lesson for the young boys. There is no such thing as impossible. You have to just dare it. At that point of time, I must confess, I did not know how I would do it. I did not even know whether I was capable of doing it. But I knew one thing, that I had to do it. And I said, and I explained to my boys, look, we have only two options. Either you wait here and die. An anonymous death. No one will even come to know. Or you take a chance. There's a good chance you might die. But what a way to go. And if you try, there is a chance of success. If you sit here, there is no chance of success come whatever may. When I explained it in these words, all my boys, and I told them, look, all the officers, including me, we will be leading from the front. There's no question of just ordering you chaps ahead. And in the Indian Army, we have a very fine tradition. I don't know how many of my young boys know this. Whenever you're marching forward and you come across a minefield, the enemy minefield, you know what's a mine? The small thing that you put under the ground, you cannot see, you cannot detect because they make it out of plastic over there. And you step on it and your leg goes. The whole stump goes from here. Most painful. And when someone hits the mine, in the tradition, true tradition of the Indian Army, as soon as you hit the mine, we again make it into a rod formation. There is a single file. And do you know who hits that file? The officer there. These are the fine traditions of an Indian Army. The officer is the first man then. Come what may. So I said, in this battle, I as the commanding officer and my officers will be leading right from the front. If I see anybody hesitating and not moving towards the objective, I'll be the first man to shoot him. And if you see me hesitating, not moving towards the direction, you have the full rights to shoot me. Just by saying this much, the boys were absolutely charged up. They said, sir, we'll do it. Let's do it. Then we plan. 14 hours walk from here to there. 14 hours. And in these 14 hours, I get just about 4 or 5 hours of darkness. When do I want the darkness? Do I want it when I start? So that I maintain the surprise? Or do I start during the daytime and get it here during the dark over here? When I come there next to the objective. And both have got their pluses and minuses. So good military judgment. I said, look, let them know I'm coming. Doesn't matter. I'll make sure that I pound them over here with whatever little artillery we've got and my own mortars. And then I move here. But when I'm closest to him and all his small arms weapons are bearing on me, that is the time I want the darkness because I don't want him to fire aimed shots at me. Secondly, this looks so small over here, but this is more than 14 or 15 kilometers. It's huge. That's why I tell people, if you ever want to be humble, please go, stand next to a mountain. You see the strength and the might of nature. And then you will know what an insignificant, small spot you are. As far as, I mean, when, when you compare yourself against nature. It's a huge area. I said, I will go here. But once I come here, he doesn't know whether I'm going to hit him at 4812, bunker, Kaluga, top, or 0.5278. That is my surprise. And we started in earnest. We kept moving here. Fire started coming on us initially over the heads. Later on, one scraped my boot and then we started running. In high altitude with that load, I didn't know the people were capable of running. But when it comes to life, my dear friends, <laughs> Asafa Powell would have been left behind. 
we were zigzagging from rock to rock to rock to rock. And in one such, such moment, remember the commanding officer is the oldest guy in the whole battalion. I was running out of breath and I told my radio operator and the other chap, I said, look, look for a little biggish boulder so I can take uh, at least about 40 seconds or maybe one minute or two minutes of rest before we start again sprinting. He said, TK sir, we looked ahead, we saw a big boulder. As he, he pointed to me. It was getting, you know, slightly evening, twilight. I ran for it. I was about to sit down when I saw a huge cacti plant like that with those bristles, you know, spiky things coming. I tried my best, but I didn't have the guts, so I had to leave that regretfully. And I went and occupied another small stone. I was breathing hard. And suddenly from behind, I could hear some heavy breathing, real heavy breathing. <sighs> and I saw one bulky gentleman almost running past me. I saw he was one of our majors who had just come from a posting from Delhi. He was little <laughs> on the plus side, he breathing very heavy, eyes totally focused onto the same boulder which I couldn't occupy. I told him, he was, his name was Chris, I said, Chris, Chris, but Chris was no go. He was only for that boulder. He ran for it. He saw that cacti plant over there with those spiny uh, spindles over there and he sat down. <laughs> we asked him later, how didn't it pain? He said, sir, it was painful, there's no doubt about it, but it was very comfortable. <laughs> And because of his perforations on his behind, we started referring to him as Holy Christ from that day onwards. <laughs> now, we had reached the bottom or the base of Khalugan top and we started moving up. When we moved up, somewhere around 600 yards short of the objective, the firing was too intense. The people left and right were getting ripped by bullets. And it's not an easy sight for a commanding officer when there's total mayhem, his own boys getting ripped apart in front of him, the bullets, the rocket launchers doing the damage. It was a very, very sad day for me. Every time a boy would be hit, I would kneel down, sit down, talk to him for a few seconds. I say, Beta, I cannot leave anyone behind for you because I can't reduce my vayner strength. I have to move up. I hope you'll understand. He should say, Saad, it's paining a lot. It's very, very painful and I'm bleeding, just tie it up, leave me some water, give me my rifle, up, upar jaake, but please come down quickly, sir. Please send us down quickly for treatment. I said, son, don't worry, I'll do my best. And I would ask my boys to drag them next to the stones, show them where the enemy fire was coming from, leave a bottle of water over there and move ahead. One such boy, boy was hiccuping very, very vigorously when I held him by my uh, in my on my lap and I was talking to him, he couldn't understand what I was saying. I couldn't see any bullet wound, but he died in my laps. And when I put him down like this, my hands were feeling wet and suddenly I realized that his brains were seeping through my fingers. He had got a hit over here and his whole scalp was off over here and his whole brains were pouring out from there. Seeing so many mangled bodies in front of you, very disturbing sight. And every time I gave an order to a guy to go left and right and negotiate this or take that bunker or fire on so-and-so and attack so-and-so bunker, it wasn't that boy's face that I saw in front of me. I saw the face of his wife, his son, his daughter, his mother asking me a question, Colonel, why are you sending my son? Don't you know that his chances of coming back alive are very less? It's a tremendous load on a commanding officer. You see, because after the moment has passed, everybody becomes Aristotle. On hindsight, everybody is the wisest man. Everybody will point fingers. He said, why? How? Why have you given such an order where so many people have died? It's a heavy, heavy burden on the commanding officer. And every order that you give will result in death, that's for sure. It might result in success, but it shows to uh, end up resulting in the deaths of many.
that is the time I said I must pause and see what is wrong. I stopped the boys there. I looked around. I saw that the firing was coming most from these two places. One from bunker area and one from Khalubar top. Bunker area I saw about three, four bunkers only. And I got hold of the officer who was closest to me, Captain Manoj Pandey. I gave him 40 boys. I said, son, go. Finish those two, three bunkers which are holding us up. Meanwhile, I'll muster whatever people I can over here and I'll charge up simultaneously. And while he got his 40 people and moved there, I was also charging up. What happened with Manoj Pandey was, initially we thought there were just two, three bunkers. But there were six bunkers echelon right behind each other. He finished the first, the second, the third by fire and move. You know, you go there, he fires at you. You separate a group over here, they fire back at him, so he fires back at you there. Meanwhile, you separate a group there. He puts their attention here. These people creep in closer, these people creep in closer. Then again, he fires there, they creep closer. And then you go close to the enemy, through that loophole of his bunker, you throw the grenade and you finish it. But it's so easy said. To do it, you require the heart of a lion. And this young boy had it in him. He did that. He finished three, four bunkers like this. But when he was at the fourth bunker, or rather the third bunker, he got a bullet, a shot of bullet over here and on his thigh and he started bleeding profusely. Now this boy at this point of time could have said, I've done my job. And he could have finished off. And he would have rested and taken, uh, rest and taken uh, medical care. When the boys told him, he said, no. I have been ordered to finish this fourth bunker also and I will finish it. Because the two other bunkers which were further off was finished off by one of our Havaldars, the Devan. Havaldar Devan, who also did a brave job and he charged headlong and he finished those bunkers. So when he crawled closer to the fourth bunker to finish it off, by now he was bleeding profusely, he has lost a lot of blood, he has become weak. He got up, he threw the grenade, the grenade did the job, but before that, he got a burst of bullet right through his head over here. And he died, died over there. He fell down dead. Just 23 years old. A very, very brave boy from Lucknow, Captain Manoj Pandey. And while all this was happening, we had started moving up towards the Kalubar top here. It was a moonlit evening. I remember the boys ahead of me slashing everything in sight. Whenever the clouds left the moonlight to come through, I could see that the Pathans were being chopped, their heads were being hacked. It was a slope like this. I thought the rocks were falling down. It was actually the heads rolling down, the Pathani heads rolling down. My boys, five feet nothing, jumping up and chopping off this Pathan, six feet something. What a sight. When they saw it happening, for them that was the worst way to go. They left everything and they started running. And finally, we reached the top here by around 4 o'clock in the morning. Just about made it. And the last was a burst of machine gun fire from this side, which hit me on my leg, left leg. And now, before we could settle down, there were approximately about 500 to 600 of us who had started from here. I had kept one platoon over here to make sure that these people don't come down and cut off my rear. And one platoon over here to make sure these people don't come down. And I had proceeded ahead. I had about two companies plus. That means about 400 or 400 plus people with me. When I reached on top, I could bear, I had just barely sat down over there when we were counterattacked. We repulsed the counterattack here and I asked my boy, let's quickly consolidate this area and count how many of us are on top. When he counted the number of people on top, including me, with a bullet in my leg, we were just eight of us. And now we were preparing for the next counterattack. And the enemy kept on attacking us here. I think it was the third counterattack when the radio set, which was next to me, started crackling and said, one five tiger message, message, message over. And I kept saying out, out, because out means I don't want to speak to you. I said, here I'm fighting for my life and someone wants directions from me at this time, of, uh, uh, this point of time. What had happened was, and after some time I said, okay, pass a message. What has happened was, there was one captain who was located here and from here he could see everything that was happening this side. And he would pass the message to me. 
Sir, there are about 25 people from the west coming on to you from Kaluga top. They are making noise this side, but they are coming from that side. So with eight people now, instead of taking an all-round defense, I would face the enemy like this, keep quiet, let them come up. And they were coming up, we were talking with them. They were using the choices, you know, the most parliamentary language that you could think of, and coming up. And I was also giving to back, back to them in equal measure. And then I would suddenly get up, fire at them and sit down. Things went off like this for some time, three nights, and after that we were running short of ammunition. We had, I had only two bullets in my magazine, I distinctly remember, and I looked at my boys, they were also looking sad, they also said just one, two, they were giving me signals over there. And the mood was down in the dumps, and that is the time I said I must change the mood, otherwise things will be bad. So again, the Pakistanis, they were coming up, aise aise kar denge, waise waise kar denge. I told you I had a Punjabi friend. The best, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure he would have been very proud of me. My vocabulary was fantastic, it was absolutely flawless. And I gave it back to him in chest Punjabi. But my boys were quiet, because in Gurkhas we hardly curse, or, you know, you don't use these gallies. I said, I must now improve the situation, they are getting too grim. So when they were giving gallies, I got up, I said, Bloody fools, tumhare commanding officer sahab ko ye log itna ganda gali de rahe, tum log chup chap bethai, gali do. The boys looked at each other like this, they started nudging each other. They said, this is a very tough task, but if the commanding officer has said, because of the discipline in the Gurkhas, you cannot disobey. And they finally found Ram Bahadur, who was from Dehradun, where he, they thought he must have learned something at least. <laughs> so he got up, took out his kukri and looked at me like this. I said, yes, yes, Kalido. <laughs> he looked up, he was I think 4 feet nothing, not even 5 feet nothing. Over the slope where the Pakis were coming from there, he says, Pakistani kutta, upar aira tera mundi gaira. So I told him, I said, Ram Bhadur, Pakistani log mare ga, lekin wo haan sas ke mare ga ki gorkha lo gali bhi nahi de sakta hai. But that got the mood going and they said, Saab, Goli nahi hai toh kya ho gaya hai? Humare pas khukri hai na, khukri se mare ga. I said, good. And then they came. And while they were coming up, I was cursing everything. I was cursing the day I was there. I was cursing everybody on this earth. I said, what is this I have done to deserve such a death? Cold, desolate place. Will my people ever, even get a chance to see my face after that? Because knowing Pakistanis, they mutilate the bodies. Really, I was very, very angry and sore at everybody. I said, have I, what have I done to deserve this? I am going to die in this cold, desolate place. Will people even know that we existed? People must be discussing which movie to see now back home. And somehow, when you see, you know, when they say when the death comes to you suddenly, you don't realize it, it's okay. But when you see death walking and coming towards you, sure-footed, it's not a very good feeling at all. And then suddenly I remembered that they had, my brigade commander had said, that after a few days you might get additional artillery which can give you support here. I said, fine. I asked my artillery officer, do we have the guns? He said, they have just come. What do you want? I said, you fire on my head. He said, please repeat. I said, fire six rounds rapid fire. He had 18 guns, six into 18, 108 bombs. I said, fire on my head. Then I had to use Punjabi to convince him to fire fast. And he did. He gave me fire. I remember the Pakistanis came up over there. And as they came up, the shelling started. They didn't know, we knew it. We had hidden ourselves in the absolutely, you know, by now we had become an expert over there. We knew where the uh, bombs were coming from. And the bombs fell all around there. I could see the Pakis blowing right in front of me. Thrice it happened. And on the fourth day, my second in command, he came up with the reinforcements. And ladies and gentlemen, I am proud to tell you, the first 11 Gurkha rifles planted the Tiranga Janda on Kalubar top.
we have done that. I have told you in many, very uh, brief uh, thing because the, the the stories can go on and on. I told you it's it's basically uh, a never-ending saga. It can go on. There are so many brave boys, so many people did so many things, but I cannot because of the lack of time. But suffice to say, when I told the general that I had taken Kaluba Tau, first he said, are you sure? I said, sir, I am standing here and I am sure about it. He said, in that case, Lalit, you have given us the biggest victory of Batalik. It is the turning point. Can you please capture this, 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 this area? <laughs> he actually said that to me. I said, sir, I have not eaten food, I am just uh, skin and bones. He said, okay, I, you, I don't mind to take uh, about uh, 24 hours rest. I said, fine. I took 24 hours rest and I am happy to tell you, I had some fantastic young officers. We captured this complete area over here, this area, this area. 0 0.5300 was the last place where we got stuck. There was another battalion given a task to capture part of this here. We captured our part here, they could not capture their part. For two days, we kept on getting bombarded by the enemy because this point was held by them. Till I again volunteered and uh, one of our officer, uh, who is uh, whose father is also here amongst us, he was part of the commando group whom I sent from behind like this. They climbed up like lizards from behind. The Pakis didn't know where, where these people came from and they attacked them. and. We chased them back from 5300 and they have gone. Ours was the first battalion that was inducted. We were the first ones to chase them beyond the line of control. And in the next 11 days, we had captured as many as 11 posts, formidable posts of the enemy. And for this sterling performance, the uh, President of India and the Chief of Army Staff gave us the unit citation. We got the Paramveer Chakra for uh, this nation's highest award for uh, Captain Manoj Pandey. Three wheel chakras include mine. <laughs> 32 gallantry awards. And above all, my uh, battalion now has been given the title of the bravest of the brave. Without taking much time, I'll just quickly run through some of the vignettes of the battles in Batalik sector. I would, I'm sure you'd like to see some of it. It's very interesting. This is what a Sangar looks like. Loose stones without cement. But you can see the loophole. This is the backside view. You can see the loophole. They put the machine gun over here and they fire in front. When you fire back, it's ineffective unless you blow it up. This is General Kishanpal. He's the core commander. Is the audio on? He's the core commander who was there in battle and he has something to tell us about 11 GR. The Aldo sector, the turning point came at the moment Khalu Ridge was captured. Uh, and uh, the lion's share for capture of Khalu Ridge goes to 111 GR um, under the leadership of Lieutenant Lalit Rai. <laughs> the 111 GR is a 12th battalion with a history of fierce loyalty and ferocious combat. There are few fighting forces in the world that can match the friends of the Gurkhas. To the cries of Jema Kali, these forces were unleashed upon the Pakistanis in Khaluba. In the lines of Khaluba, we saw one of the most intensive battles in uh, recent military history. Where the Aldo captured, the turning point came at okay. the moment Khaluba Ridge was captured. Uh, yeah. Okay, this is the rocket launcher. You see how we destroyed the bunkers over there. This is how we charged up. These are the lower areas later on when we do the operations. This is a destroyed bunker, the, like the one which you saw being blown up. And these red rounders over here, you can see red blotches over here. If you check it out, it will have Pakistani DNA. <laughs> these are the multi-barrel rockets which are firing in support. They can fire and give you support from 30 kilometers behind. 
This is the artillery support which we got. The gunners did a wonderful job, saved my life. Those were the type of cannons which gave me 108 bombs on my head. This is the Indian Air Force over Kargil. They also gave us very good support and in initial stages they did blow up a lot of administrative dumps of the enemy which was uh, behind the, uh, or on the, in the area, in the region next to the line of control. But uh, the, the Pakis had with them the Stinger missiles and the Stinger missiles have got an umbrella range of 4 kilometers. Therefore, the Air Force had to have a standoff distance of almost 6 kilometers from the top from where they had to fire. And since the interstate distance between us and the enemy was so close, I mean we were eyeball to eyeball, possibly uh, nothing much could be given in terms of ground support, ground fire support. We keep complaining about conditions. Ye nahi hai, wo nahi hai, this is not there, that is not there. See the conditions that we functioned in. This is the attack plan that I am making, which could result in the deaths of thousands of people. I just had a map sheet with me like this and my people around me and we are making a major plans on that. This is how I used to talk to my boys before the battle to serve them up. And this is one of those last few operations that were left. And uh, after this we were supposed to go beyond this mountain over here and attack an uh, enemy post. This is the puja that we used to do before any battle, the puja of the Kukri, the might of the Gurkha soldier. That was young Rawat. This is Major Aril Singh with his Kukri. Don't be fooled by the small size of the Kukri. Preparation for war, you just see what happens, how they start sharpening their Kukris. The most fearless fighters, the Gurkhas, I think it was General Maneksha who said, if someone tells you that he is not scared of death, he says either he is a big liar or he is a Gurkha. This is how we took the cover from enemy shelling. Uh, this is a favorite picture of mine. You see this was over here. There is, uh, this is all wild grass. I sent a guy walking two days just to get this wild grass for this was. And what is this was? It's just a 60 millimeter bomb container. And this small uh, support over here on which the Durga's uh, uh, statue is there is actually an empty ammunition box. This cylindrical object on which we put Agarbatis was is a 81 millimeter bomb container. This big base on which the Mandir rests is an empty rocket crate. This black cylindrical object where we have put rice and other offerings to God is actually a rocket launcher container cap. This small thing on which the diyas are burning is actually a small arms ammunition crate. And the diyas which are burning bright are actually used automatic grenade launcher shells. We just put dal and put them. Now this picture I just wanted to share with you. I shared with my boys. I said, look, whenever we went for an operation, we drew a lot of shakti, a lot of powers from this place before the attack. And after the war was over, all these items were salvage items. We threw them off. I said, where was the shakti? Where was that power? I said, it's within you. Taj Blue Diamond is the five-star hotel in Pune and this is my five-star hotel there. You can see my skin is almost burnt. Normally what happens is uh, when, you, when you are in high altitude, your whole skin gets burnt and then you can peel it off like paper, you know, like this. That's why I was in uh, a lighter mood telling people 
that Hindustan liver would have been the happiest uh, people to come here and take us for advertisements for their fair and lovely. You just take it, peel it off, you know. <laughs> so this is the Taj blue diamond of mine. Whenever I slept, my head was in one level, my torso was in another level, and my legs were in a different level. But yet it was a very, very comfortable and a lovely place. This was the weather prior to our attack of Kaluvar. Absolutely marrow chilling, freezing, painful. And you can see us there. We are just waiting for that hour to come for us to move ahead. And this is the Kaluvar top. Isn't it lovely? This is the victory at Kaluvar top. You can see the machine guns. When the machine guns fired at us, you know what is the rate of the machine gun fire? A huge 14.7 mm. It was actually an air defense gun which they were firing at us. And I remember once I was hiding behind a rock and these bullets would come and every time a bullet came it ate up part of that rock. And I was getting scared if this fellow keeps on firing at it like this, soon it will come through. Huge! And the rate of fire is 1000 rounds a minute. And there are almost 30 odd uh, machine guns like this firing at us. This was one of my boys who had uh, this thing in one of the later operations. You can see the mood of the boys. See, they are standing very far off and you can hear them screaming even there. Look at that. This is the felled enemy at Kalupar. Most of the places, the bodies had no heads. I had given them strict orders not to chop heads of people whom we have, uh, who, who are all, uh, where the places where we almost captured. But my boys in a rush, they didn't spare anybody. And uh, when I wanted to visit that place, they quickly got the heads and the torsos together. But they made a few mistakes, you know, wrong torso, wrong head, with the result. With the result, some of them had extremely long necks. <laughs> we had enough to fill up a whole hall like this, the amount of things we captured. These are the Stinger missiles, deadly. The Americans had given it to the Pakistanis during the Afghan war. They are trying their best to buy them back, giving them ten times the price, but the Pakistanis are not giving it back. It's a very, very versatile weapon. This is the first prisoner of war at Batalik, but rest assured, he is not one of the chaps who have been captured by us because we didn't capture anybody. But he was from the 5 Northern Light Infantry which was opposed to us and he was crying profusely. When I told him, now see the day is over, now the uh, battle is over, you can go back to your regiment. He says, Janab, kaun si regiment? Aap log ne sab khatam kar diya mara. And he had actually requested that before he sent to Delhi, he should be shown a Gurkha soldier. And that is why I had taken one of my boys to meet this man. People were saying that, uh, Musharraf was saying that, no, no, it was not the soldiers. They were just those uh, militants. So I will just show you something very interesting here. The other man is my second in command there. You see the chain, ammunition chain? Identity cards. Frontier Regiment was... Clips of the captain whom we had killed over there. The ribbons. Their pay books are absolutely like ours. Left back from the British Raj, not a comma or a spelling left or right. We could have used it for hours. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
Surprisingly, in the initial stages, we captured a lot of these pay books and identity cards. But when the TV uh, people started showing all this, probably they got the orders to hide all these and they pulled them back. Five Northern uh, Light Infantry. These are the bodies of Pakistani uh, soldiers. This Malvi who is standing here giving the last rites is from the Indian Army. I don't know how many of you know that one of our regiments has a Muslim company and they fought very well. And a very fascinating thing happened in Kargil. The battle cry of this company is Allahu Akbar. And when they went and attacked that post saying Allahu Akbar, the Pakistanis stopped firing thinking that by mistake our own people are attacking us. <laughs> and they captured it. So Musharraf refused to take their bodies, dead bodies back because taking it back would mean accepting the fact that the Pakistani soldiers took part in this war. And while they mutilated our bodies, we were taught in the Indian Army that your enemy is your enemy till such time he is alive. But once he is dead, please give him the full honours of a soldier. Because he was doing his duty and we buried them with full honours like this. And the complete military, the complete armies of the world, they wrote back and said, the Indian Army has truly become a very professional and a good army on this account. This is the INSAS bullet which we use in our weapons. And this is the bullet that was being used by the Pakistanis on us, 14.7 mm. This is the 105 mm shell and this is the 130 mm shell. And the ones which was fired on top of us, the Beauforts, was 155 millimeters. This is the binocular that saved my life. At one point of time, when I had this binocular on my chest, two shots rang out from the sniper. He was aiming at my heart. And the bullet went in like this and came out like this. I still have this binocular with me. This is Captain Manoj Pandey, Paramveer Chakra, a brave young boy. We were very fascinated because we, when we went to NDA, we pulled out his dossier to see what he had written when he was a young officer. Most of us, when we go to the academy and we are asked to write as to what you want to be and what you want to achieve in life, you know, you have to write a small essay. Most of us write, I want to be the chief of army staff, I want to be a general, I want a foreign posting, I want to be the commanding officer, etc, etc. We keep saying that. You know what this young boy had written? He had just written that when I grow up, I want to take part in a war and I want to win the Paramir Chakra. But the saddest thing is, it had to be posthumous. I only wish it was while he was alive. This is the president giving me the field chakra. This is the chief of army staff giving me the uh, parchment for the bravest of the brave. This is a silver thing where it is written. <laughs> this is during the music launch of LOC at Mumbai. That is JP Datta. Fascinating thing here is the actual Fauji's are in series and the actors are in uniform. <laughs> when I went to attend this uh, function, this gentleman, Sudesh Berry, in LOC plays my role, Colonel Lalit Rai. He walks up to me with a jacket where Lalit Rai is written there and he says, Good morning, Colonel. I am Colonel Lalit Rai. I said, Nice to meet you, sir. <laughs> I was telling you that Pakistan has always been saying that they are winning. Now just look at this, Kargil has been Pakistan's biggest blunder. Pakistani people who were told that Pakistan is winning the war are bewildered and humiliated. Benazir Bhutto herself is writing this. In the next one where Brigadier Siddiqui, who are hardcore uh, Fauji, he himself has written, Kargil was no trophy for Pakistan. Was it then a trauma? A rash word to use. Someone at a recent seminar called it a catastrophe, another faux pas. Yet another debacle and so on. I think the fourth estate, our boys, uh, the media's, media boys, they did a wonderful job for once Pakistan knows 
very very clearly that it has really got a spanking and they have not won the war. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to place on record my grateful thanks to young Aditya Soni and uh, other committee members, CN Kumar, Jairaj, etc. For this wonderful initiative, the Thamaya Memorial uh, Initiative which they have started, this is a great feeling to, as an old Katonian to be here amongst the other Katonians and the future leaders, the present Katonians. When I came here and stood outside, I was mesmerized. The school is looking beautiful, much better than what it was when we were here. But like I requested the principal, I said, you have the place where I am standing here, probably I had a lot of wrestling matches with my friends. This was the third level field. I said, please, as a request from an old Catonian, do not remove the other fields for other buildings. Please maintain them. As a true Catonian, I have been, every school that I go to, I have been fighting myself by saying I am an old Catonian and perhaps ours is the only school which has got four playing fields, the first level, second level, third level and fourth level. And as you grow in age and your class, you keep getting promoted to your levels, to your first level. I remember playing in all these fields over here, till I played for the school team and then I was in 8th standard, the football team. And to my young friends, all I have to say is, you have a long way to go. You have a fantastic history behind you. You have such illustrious people who are here, some of them are here and some of them who are past who are like beacons, who are like people you can idolize, heroes whom you can emulate. Please keep the Catonian spirit high. Please keep it living high. I wish you all the best in your endeavors. And I would also like to thank the school, the principal, and the rest of you to have taken out your time to come and uh, listen to a humble soldier. It augurs well, like I said that a soldier has been honored. When you honor me here as a soldier, you actually honor all the soldiers. And I represent today the soldiers who fought. And some of my boys, <laughs> and some of my boys who cannot be here today because they gave their everything, but probably this message in the terms of an epitaph which I took from the tombs of Kohima, and it will aptly describe what they want to say. When you go home, tell them of us and say. When you go home, tell them of us and say, for your tomorrow, we gave out today. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. of time and I'm given to understand that the students also have uh, exams on the anvil. I request you to keep the Q&A as short as possible. Perhaps we'll take about, subject to Colonel Lalit's convenience, maybe about three or four questions. I would request you to kindly briefly introduce yourself and make a very brief comment or pose a brief question, please. Thank you. Yeah. Chakra.
Like an army man would say, sir, please shoot. Certainly, <laughs> Khan, you know who I am. Sir, I think. Uh, I wish I had given the introduction that uh, my friend uh, Sushant I gave. I could have recalled quite a few episodes of your behavior here in the cartoons, which would have given us a lot of fun. Yes, I'd just like to say just one few things, because I'm addressing the school after all. Uh, thank you for being a cartoonian. Thank you for making me feel so proud to say that I was in cartoons with Ladit Rai. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Everybody knows what Kernel is. I just like to share one of your things. Kernel was, I knew him well. He was probably the most beautiful boy that ever joined Kernel because he was very good looking. You're saying he <laughs> Yeah. And uh, well, there was a time when he had to do change. He went uh, to of all the colleges he joined. It was Satya Sai College. Satya Sai College, and well, kind of like, and Satya Sai College decided that they could go on better. He went on better, went on to the MBA, but all the beautiful lady in MBA, married a beautiful lady, and went on to become adjutant MBA scholar also of the OTU. A lot of things. I'm proud of him. He has gone a long way, considering that most of us, uh, in school, he went on straight on. It was not his problem that the road turned. <laughs> so he went on. Okay, besides, come. On. There's only one question I asked. Yes, you have done a lot, but I believe the Indian Army today is suffering from a big shortage of officer material. You as an officer know that many of the regiments are now having to at almost 25-30% vacancies in some of the technical regiments as much as 50% officer vacancies. What do you as an officer think we all should do to help better the situation? Thank you. Uh, there's a saying in Maharashtra that everybody wants another Shivaji to be born but not in their house, in their neighbor's house. <laughs> I think that sums it up all. I think it's high time we look into this. It's important to have money. It's important to have a good life. But it's equally important to have good people at the helm of affairs where it matters, where the security of the nation matters. Yes, I need to leave. Any other questions? Yeah. Lokesh. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Lokesh Akrapa. I'm 76 back. I, in fact, I do remember Colonel Lalit Rai. He was a wonderful sportsman. Uh, my question to you, Colonel, is you yourself mentioned that you used to settle a few scores in school by going uh, behind the chapel. Now, <clears throat> for people who don't like war and fighting, do you think there could be a better way of sorting out these kind of uh, issues? You've fought three wars for your admission already on this CIS in Malaysia, and there will probably be many more. Now, just in lighter way, couldn't you just have, say, a CIS in Malaysia hockey match and just finish it off, or a football match? You know, this, uh, I just like your opinion on this, since. Uh, Today, I think we would rather not fight wars. All due respect to, this, to what the army is doing, but it's a little difficult for some people to understand. Uh, I would like to say two things here. Firstly, surprising as it may sound, that the people who love peace most is perhaps most of the Indian army. Who likes war? We don't like war. But you should also know that a military action is basically an extension of a political will. And when the political will wills it, I don't think a military man should have any choice or any doubts. And as far as resolving issues peacefully is concerned, I am all for it. I think that's a wonderful thing to happen. But like, again, George Bernard Shaw said, to have peace you must wage war. So we are caught in this loop. And if I could hasten to add that if we did fix up a football match, we would win. Because uh, I have read that General Timaya, when he was part of the then Hyderabad and later Kumao, his two major challenges were to beat the Sikh regiment in hockey 
and the Gurkhas in football. <laughs> I think he did it in hockey. I don't think he did it in football. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, General Paul. Well, the presentation is so good and so full of motivation. Have you given this presentation to the army headquarters? Who could use this uh, material, drawing material to the army? Well, I haven't given it to the army headquarters, sir, but uh, uh, I must share with you the genesis of me making this uh, presentation and giving it to people, especially schools and colleges. I have done it uh, in a fair, uh, to a fair degree. The genesis is, uh, for the first six months after the war, I did not speak to anybody. I couldn't speak to anybody. I used to get nightmares. And I used to sweat from the nape of my neck, even while sleeping. I couldn't, I, I, my, I couldn't even get sleep. I used to get total nightmares. And one day, once the dust settled down, one of the widows came up to me. And she had collected all whatever she was due. We had called her to the regiment, to the battalion. And before leaving, she came and cried in front of me. She had two small toddlers. And she asked me, Sir, you've told me that my husband was a very brave man and that he really did well in war and he sacrificed himself, he sacrificed everything. But she says, tell me, besides you and few of the battalion officers and the men, how many other people know what my husband did? Will they ever know? And these words actually stung me. They actually stung me and from that day onwards, whenever I get a chance, I always try and convey what our boys did out there. So that is my inspiration and that is the true genesis of my talks. I, I don't quite answer the question, sir. Thank you. I really don't have a question this evening, uh, but you know when I came by this evening, my name is Robert King, and uh, I was uh, the same 71 batch with Lalit Rai, and when I came to the front of the auditorium this evening, somebody thought was that I was the speaker's brother, because we happened to look alike. But we were together, I think he was, uh, Lalit Rai was in uh, 10C when we were in the 10th, and uh, 10C, right? Yes, Tennessee section, and we were in the garden block, if you remember as well. Which was, Robert, which was the section which never studied well and got low marks? <laughs> I, I was in B. And you know, all I can remember, the... He changed it to B, now you are also in C. <laughs> no, I was, in, I was in B. And you know, I only remember those uh, of the Cotonians that really excelled in games and sports, because, you know, we were most of the time on the field, like the third world, the other side, in the first eleven field, second eleven field, the third learn field. And our principal there, I must recognize this evening, is uh, Mr. Barbara is there. And I was in Patton Wall's house. And uh, we did very really encouraging us both in academics and in games. And uh, both of us, uh, you know, he remembered that we played football together for the first level that year in 1971, I think. And uh, Lalitha was an excellent football player. And he played right in. And then we had 5 3 2, he played right in. And I supported him with. Uh, playing the right half and uh, Lalitha was in Pope House and this evening when I heard that Lalitha was speaking here I made it a point and I think it's after 35 years that we just got to meet this evening and I just want to uh, congratulate you and that was a Thank you, splendid presentation uh, Lalitha and we're proud of you all of the problems. Uh, I would just like to draw attention of everybody here uh, we have amongst us here uh, a proud father of a young officer who was serving with me at the time of war. His name was that time Captain Akshay Chandran. And his father, Colonel Kiyar Chandran, was also the commanding officer of 711 GR, which is the sister battalion of 1st 11 GR. He was also my commanding officer when I was serving with 711 GR. And I think I'll be failing in my duty unless I, unless until I ask him to stand up because his son did a great job in war. Sir, Mr. Kiyar Chandran. The opportunity to place on record our gratitude to many of the other Gorkha rifle officers.
officers who joined us today. Please. Today is uh, in March of 90. And from? Uh, 90. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm proud to be a Cambodian sir. My God, that says it all my boy. <laughs> we all are proud. So I would like to tell you to tell the parents who don't like to send their uh, uh, son, sons to uh, like, uh, join the army. They are also proud. Thank you. So, what you like to tell the parents uh, who don't like to send their sons to the <laughs> army or something? I think only tell them to send them. <laughs> <laughs> I think that is uh, the question as far as Lalit is concerned because he is himself a third generation army man. Shivdev. Good evening, uh, Colonel Lalitwai. My name is Shivdev and I am from the 1973 batch, 73. Okay. One question is, will there ever be an end to this confrontation or this uh, struggle for the control of uh, Kashmir or will there be many more current wars in the future? Do you really feel Kashmir is the issue? Because now I have started doubting that. I think the issue and the malady is much deeper. I think it's more psychological than uh, Kashmir itself. Because uh, right from the beginning when you are taught to hate someone, I think uh, there's something wrong. It's not just Kashmir. Kashmir is just an excuse, I feel. But will there be an end to this kind of a, you know, loss of lives, precious lives, and uh, you know, the well, soldiers being sacrificed? Well, I really don't know whether I'm qualified, but what I can say is there has to be a change. It, it will come. But the question is how long, I don't know. But uh, yes, it has to come. Thank you. You mentioned that you got a bullet on your leg and for three days you managed. Well, when we get a headache, we can't manage for 15 minutes. How did you manage for three days? Was there any medical aid available? And if not, despite that, how you fought the battle, it is credible. It's most incredible. And I take my hands off. Thank you, sir. Good evening, Colonel. It's, it's an absolute pleasure to hear on that. Uh, my name is Spring Loki from the 1976 batch. A single question is what was lacking on the ammunitions, and it is believed that there wasn't sufficient air support that was provided during the Kar during the Kargil war. Is it a true fact? I don't think that's very true. I told you what were the problems. Of course, uh, initially there was, I believe, a little reluctance in the use of air power because that would amount to escalating the war itself. But uh, as far as the Air Force is concerned, I think they gave us good support. But there were problems because, as I understand, for the Air Force to give you ground support fire, the interstate distance between you and the enemy has to be at least one kilometer. And in mountains, it is not possible. It was eyeball to eyeball. We were actually talking to each other every day. So, in a scenario like that, I don't think Air Force could have done much. But as far as the other supplies flying in of other... Uh, your attack helicopters, etc. was concerned, I think they did a fair job. Must give them that due. Thank you. We'll make this the last question, please. Anyone else? So, uh, Thomas from 9th Standard, sir. So, we're all proud of cottons and uh, all said and done, but what, did, what is it that cottons gave, gives us or it gave you that helped you to lead up from Khar to Kabul? And what is it that we and what is it that we have to look forward to inculcate in cottons? Good question. Excellent question. I would say this, that my basic grounding in cottons was so good. We were made to believe over here that you, if you dare, then you can do it. We were made to believe 
that there is no such word as impossible. And we were made to believe that once you make up your mind to do something, see through it right to the end. And the amount of support and the amount of uh, interaction with my friends only helped me strengthen my beliefs on such matters. And it is because of this strength and the core value that I possessed as a Catonian that carried me through. Throughout my academy, my career, and even towards the world. Well, I had that quality in me and that value in me to say that yes, I can and I will. So please carry that in you. As a token of our gratitude, may I request Lalit to please wait on stage for a moment. And uh, we're deeply honored to have with us Mrs. Mireya Chengapa, General Timaya's daughter. And could I request Auntie Mireya to kindly present Colonel Lalit with a token of our appreciation. Mrs. Chengapa. Also, we're also delighted to have with us Mrs. Lalit Rai and may I request Mr. M.G. Mutana, the patron of the Old Boys Association, to kindly present Mrs. Rai with a token of our appreciation. Thank you, Mr. Mutana. I am delighted now to request my comrade, Gerald Daniel, 1970. 